transformed, mature harvest of your son come forth to your pleasure. And Lord, may the word of God today do more than bear witness to our souls. May it be a light to our feet as we walk the path of Christ being formed in us. That this would not just be a message, that this not would just be the true gospel, that it would be the life of Jesus formed in his body. Father, that takes a process. Open our hearts and our ears to prepare ourselves for the process of Christ being formed in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of my sharing is The Cross and Dross and the Cross and the Threshing and Winnowing Process. And I believe that the Holy Spirit has been bringing a perfect order through his, his body, the ministers. We've been one voice, and I believe that this is the progression of the Holy Spirit's purpose and heart with us today. I'm going to be reading a lot of scriptures because we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, I won't be able to always let you just turn to it, but you can write it down, and I will read it to you, and you can look at it later for reference. Our first scripture is going to be Luke chapter 22, verses 33 through 34, and the, the uh, subtopic of the section is called, What is Going On? What is going on? And Peter said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, but you shall three times deny that you know me. Job chapter 1 and verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? Song of Solomon chapter 4, verses 15 through 16. A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, come thou south, blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. 1 Samuel 19 and verse 2. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill you, David. And here we have the account of those who are beloved of the Lord in very strange situations. But they're beloved of the Lord. We have those who are passionately pursuing God, getting very unexpected responses from God. They're pursuing God and they're beloved of God, but some strange things are happening and they're getting some unexpected responses. Peter, God's telling him he's going to surely fail, the committed disciple. Job, the faithful servant, God's bringing Satan to his attention. The Shulamite, a picture of the bride of Christ, God's sending a storm her way. David, the anointed king who loves God, God is allowing us all. God is allowing us all to seek his life. I have a dear friend who also found herself in a very unexpected situation. And um, I'm going to have her, I'm going to read her words. I'm going to have her share this with you. And it's concerning her honeymoon. And these are her words. I was going on honeymoon, and my husband was taking me to work in a harvest field. To say the least, I was unsure about the whole idea. But on the plane, God started to speak to me. God assured me that he was in my new husband and I could trust him. Once I accepted this, my attitude changed. The first two days I took photos of the harvest and I learned how to drive an eight-wheeler tractor with trailer. The last three days I drove the tractor and trailer 10 hours every day <laughs> on my honeymoon. <laughs> At any interval I read Fruitful Living by Jesse Penn Lewis. It is about the journey of the seed. She found it for 10 cents at a thrift store when she went shopping. Sitting on a tractor in the middle of a harvest field, reading this book, I slowly came to realize threshing is important to God. And more so, it is the intimate part of relationship with Boaz. During the harvest, my husband walked up to me in the field and said, God, our father, is the great combine harvester. Against everyone in my own better judgment, I thoroughly enjoyed my honeymoon. And just for the record, after that, they went to some more romantic locations. But they <laughs> did start it off 
in a harvest field. And what a place to start off union with Christ on a harvest, combining, threshing. Listen to the technical explanation of threshing. Threshing is the process of loosening chaff from the seed. The chaff is the husk surrounding the seed. Winnowing is separating that loosened chaff from the seed. Okay, threshing may be done by beating the grain using a flail on a threshing floor. However, in developed areas, it is now mostly done by machines, usually by a combine harvester, which threshing as well as harvesting the plant and cleaning the grain. Another traditional method of threshing is to make donkeys or oxen walk in circles on the grain on a hard surface. A modern version of this in some areas is to spread the grain on the surface of a country road so the grain may be threshed by the wheels of passing vehicles. Now, an old um, tool used in threshing was called a tribulum, and it's taken from the word tribulation. So there's some tribulation found in the threshing process. Now, we've got our idea of a honeymoon. Let's just talk about this. Romantic relaxing, intimate, warm, fuzzy feelings, exotic location, okay? Now let's talk about God's idea of a honeymoon. <laughs> Separating us from our old identity. Removing our old life and ways. Bringing us into his image. Forming us as his expression, his habitation, in a vessel of his life. Now, God's idea of a honeymoon sounds more like a threshing than a romantic getaway, doesn't it? So we've got our idea and God's idea. Honeymoon is what happens after, after, after a union has taken place. After you're 100% accepted forever. After you have already been made completely one. After you're totally beloved, those things are settled. So our thought is, if I am the beloved of the Lord, if I'm in union with Christ, if I'm one with Jesus, if I'm part of his bride and his body, then he is going to treat me a certain way according to my idea of honeymoon. Now, Peter found this not to be quite so. Peter was beloved of the Lord. Amen. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, Beloved, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. So here we have a sentence that is addressed to beloved with the word strange used twice in it. Did you know strange things and unexpected things can happen to the beloved of the Lord and it's his perfect love? You know, my friend probably thought it was strange sitting on that tractor during her honeymoon and I'll bet she went through a little bit of struggle in her mind. Does my husband really love me? Why? why am I in the middle of a threshing on my honeymoon? Now, if he really, really accepted me and loved me, I'd be sitting like a queen in some exotic location in a honeymoon suite. Okay? Until she saw the Lord's heart. Until she saw the incredible thing that God had privileged her to see in type and shadow on her honeymoon. She began to see the eternal heart of the eternal groom and how he receives and deals and loves and matures his bride into his image. And her heart opened to the Lord, and she began to join with Jesus and with her husband in his purpose for Christ. And she began to learn about Jesus in ways she never knew that are changing her life right now and helping her in her walk every single day. May we be those who find the eternal purpose of our bridegroom's heart and join with him according to the true longings of why he made us one with himself, why he joined with us, the purpose behind that marriage into union with Christ. And so we can choose to leave our father and mother, our old creation identity. We can choose to leave our concepts of what Christianity should be. Happy Christianity, blessed. What is my concept of how it should be with Jesus? We get to leave that and join with his idea of how it should be. And our heart will burst with joy. We will find his heart. We will cleave to him in his purpose. And we will begin to let go of the chaff of our old life and our old nature. Ruth is a beautiful picture of this bride heart. And let me just read two scriptures out of Ruth chapter 3. I'm going to just read verse 2 and verse 5. 
And I'll just read that to you. And this is Ruth coming to Boaz on the harvest field. And she is seeking him out where? On the threshing floor. And now is not Boaz of our kindred with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. Several years ago, R.T. Nasbam shared a portion about this in a sermon. I, I believe the words that were used in that sharing speak directly to the heart, so I'm going to just read those words. Leave the relationship of Jesus having to come to you where you are, of having him come minister to you in your tent. That's where you get the thing with Ruth, isn't it? Boaz is in there working in the field. Boaz is in the threshing floor, and he's dividing. What's Boaz doing in there? He's separating the wheat from the chaff, the true seed, from stuff that looks right, but it's not him. It's not the true seed. So in his work and in his doing, Boaz gets weary. Boaz does not go home. He lays down on the threshing floor because his heart is there with the dividing so that his harvest, the harvest of his body, will finally be divided and not this mixed thing. But the work is long and hard, and Boaz lies down and covers himself with his blanket, and he goes to sleep, and all of a sudden he feels the presence of somebody. His blanket goes up, and somebody slips under it at his feet. He looks down, and it's Ruth. She's been one of many workers that all worked in the harvest field, who all had the ministry of the harvest field. But this one busted a move. She sought out Boaz on the threshing floor. And when she did that, that was it. Boaz knew. She didn't come kneel up beside him and say, excuse me, Boaz, wake up. I need some handfuls of extra blessings. I've come to get some stuff from you that makes me happy. She positioned herself with him in the threshing process to bring him a bride that was after his kind. Hallelujah. Paul said to, to believers in the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 23, Cleave to the Lord with purpose of heart. Cleave to the Lord with purpose. Cleave to the Lord according to the purposes of his heart. Stay with him. Stay with him in the process. There is a cleaving to Jesus' heart when we're in the threshing and the tribulation that's involved in bringing forth Christ. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 2 shows this beautiful effect it has on the very heart of God. Listen to his words. Go and cry, cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember you in the kindness of thy youth, in the love of thy espousals. When you went after me in a wilderness, in a land that was not sown, we need to cleave to Jesus when we're unthreshed, Christ is unformed. We're a barren wilderness. We see our flesh, our chaff, our dross. We feel like a disaster, but by golly, we love Jesus, and we're going to be conformed to his image, and we're going to go after God until we awaken his likeness. Amen. We are going to cleave to the Lord with purpose of heart, like Ruth did with Boaz until he threshes us into his image. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. This gospel better be life in us. Or what do we have? And it has to take a process. There is a process we must go through every day. Say every day. Every day. So Christ can become life in us. And that's what I'm sharing on, that process. That process. When we love him this way, when we cleave to him this way, guess what? God remembers it. He cherishes the memory of, of that first love. It ministers to him. It may not be the son ministering to him yet through you, but that heart ministers to him, and it eventually will bring forth Christ. Hallelujah. Wedding vows say, in sickness or in health, for better, for worse, we're going to be together. Well, that's just an earthly shadow and type of Christ and his truth. In sickness or in health, threshed or unthreshed, we are one with Jesus, and we're going to be with him. Amen. We are going to be with him in the dark night of our threshing till Christ be formed. Because why? We love him. We love him more than our own life that we're going to lose in that process. Hallelujah. To gain 
the unworthy to be compared to the lost gain of Christ, the eternal weight of glory formed in the gold that comes from the refiner's fires. Hallelujah. According to Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5, our husband is our maker. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. God, we have to get this in our hearts. The one who threshes us, the one who lets us go through that fire to purify his son in us, is our husband. We are his beloved. We are already one and accepted. This is the process he uses to bring us into maturity, to bring forth his image in us. Now, this next part is called purification must accompany consecration. And please try to follow me here because it's really going to help bring some clarity to what the Spirit is saying to us. Now, consecration, we do business with God. During this conference, many of us have done some deep business with God at the altar. We've made vows to the Lord. We've dedicated ourselves to the Lord. We've made heart commitments. And we've asked God to do what? Ever it takes for Christ to be formed in us. Listen, we're functioning as priests. We're dedicating ourselves to the Lord. Did you know Peter? Here he is again, Peter. In his first epistle, chapter 2, verses 5 and 9, says that New Testament, after the resurrection, believers are a royal priesthood and a holy priesthood. That we are the body of of the consecrated son, we are the body. And that priesthood is fulfilled in us. And in the Old Testament, we have shadows and types of how God deals with those who want to be given unto him in this way, how he deals with his priests. And the priests in the Old Testament have a ceremony or a, a, a consecration service. I don't know, you know what you want to call that, but a time of consecration we're going to look at that, not right away, but it's in Exodus chapter 29 is where we're going to focus on this. But in this ceremony, there are several parts that I notice. One part is there's three rams that are used. There's one ram that is called the ram of the sin offering. In different portions of scripture, I think in Leviticus, it's a bullock. But there's, a, there's an offering called the sin offering. There's a second ram called the burnt offering, the ram of the burnt offering. Okay, This is all in the consecration ceremony. There's a third ram called the ram of consecration. Now, all three of these rams, the Aaron and his sons, the priests, would lay their hands on these rams, and they would identify with them. They would identify with these rams, okay? And then, after they laid their hands on them, they, they would go through the ceremony. But we must understand that they identified with them, and that all three of these rams represent Christ and him crucified. So they're identifying with Christ and him crucified, in their consecration. Now, because we're talking about consecration, we're going to look at the ram of consecration. This ram represents Christ and him crucified in the aspect of the son who is consecrated forevermore. And I'll just give you a New Testament scripture. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 28 says, But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So, in their doing business with God, in their prayers and their vows, they lay their hands on that son that is consecrated forevermore, and they identify with him. Then they fill their hands, this is still the ram of consecration, with the breast of the ram of consecration. The breast, I believe, represents the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus, the consecrated son, they fill their hands up with that, they've identified with that, and they lift it up before God, as a wave offering. So we have all these people here at the altar praying, and let's just say they're all filling their hands with the heart of Jesus, the consecrated son, who always does the will of the Father, and they're waving it before God as a prayer. Lord, I want this heart to be formed in me. I want this life to be in me. I want to be like him and serve you all the days of my life. That's part of the consecration ceremony. Now, a lot of times when we're praying there, we think we're lifting up our own heart, don't we? And after about good 100, 200 times of doing that, walking out the door, you realize you're not the son who's consecrated forevermore. <laughs> it's, it's time to stop lifting up your heart as the wave offering. Because number one, God isn't going to receive the wave offering of your heart. 
because it's blemished really bad. He is going to receive your identification with the heart of Jesus, your life, the one you're in union with. And you wave that before him, and he's going to say, amen, I received that prayer. I received that prayer. I received that wave offering. Wave offerings going off all over the place last night. We're holding up the heart of Jesus. Okay? But then something else happened. After they held it up and waved it, and were, they ate it. They ate the heart of the consecrated son, got it in them. Got it in them. That's going to help when they have to go through the, the fires later to have that heart, not just as a prayer they remembered, but beating in their own bosom. So they have to eat that. Now, the ram of consecration, the priests ate. God could not partake of that yet. Why? The priests could partake of it. We partake of it because we need to get Jesus' heart in us. God couldn't partake of it because it hadn't passed through the fire yet and brought forth the sweet savor of his son formed and coming forth as life. Until that passes through the fire, it's still a prayer, a dedication, and something that's nourishing and filling our heart, but it is not filling God's heart yet. It's not filling up God's belly. It's not filling up his nostrils with the sweet savor of Christ until it passes through the refiner's fire, until it goes through a threshing process. We really can't fill God's heart yet with his son. So can we say it's great to believe in the message of Christ? And it's great to make vows for Christ to be formed in us. And it's great to eat the word. And it's great to be filled up with this message. But it's even better to go through the fire and let it come forth as life to the Father. Exodus 29 and 18 speaks about the ram of the burnt offering. And that's part of the ceremony too. And thou shalt burn the whole ram, the whole ram upon the altar. They've identified with that ram. They've identified with the ram of the burnt offering too. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So the burnt offering was the Lord's part. It passes through the fiery trial. It is completely consumed, and therefore it releases a sweet savor of Christ to the Father's heart and nostrils. Hallelujah. Can you see where this is really speaking to us upon whom the ends of the world have come and whom the priesthood is truly fulfilled? Hallelujah. Only what passes through the fire brings forth sweet savor to the Father of his Son. He receives our prayers, but he cannot yet partake of Christ through them. Prayers of commitment and dedication do not transform us. The transformation comes in the purifying fires, in the threshing process where the seed comes forth. Amen. Once again, Peter tells us, beloved, beloved priest, beloved bride, beloved body, Think it not strange concerning the fire. Amen. Think it not strange. Purification must accompany consecration. We think it's strange when our tender vows are answered with refiner's fire. We, we expect it to be just this glorious time of praise and worship and, and victorious overcoming. Instead, we walk out the door and we're hit in the face with a fiery trial. But God is answering your prayer. Your glorious benediction ceremony is received and on its way to purification. You are in the priesthood way. You have not missed a beat. Be encouraged, all you people who feel so depressed. You know, hallelujah. The fiery trials and threshing circumstances are not, they are not punishment. Amen? God punished his son once and for all. He doesn't do it again. Okay? It is not God rejecting us. It's him accepting us. And once and for all, it is not proof that this gospel does not work. It's proof that this gospel is at work right here. It's proof that he loves you and he's bringing you into the eternal purpose of your union with him. Now, once you get up off your knees and you're ready to go through the purification process after your prayer of consecration, you have two paths you can take. There are two views. The first view is self-improvement. Galatians 6 and verse 12 says, As many desire to make a vain show in the flesh... They constrain you to be circumcised so they don't have to suffer persecution for the cross. Whoa. Self-improvement is acting more Christ-like. Let's figure out what the lamb would do and try to do it until we freak out so bad that we expose what we really are on the inside. Let's try to refine human flesh. That's a form of humanism. We don't preach humanism. 
God does not consecrate flesh. He crucified it in his son. Now the second path is Christ being formed in us. It's the one we generally hold to. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19 is, My little children of whom I travail in birth again till Christ be formed in us. In this method, Christ is the pure. We are the dross in our old nature. Christ is the treasure. We are the earthen vessel that contains him. Christ is the seed. And we in our old nature are the chaff that must be removed. We must determine which course we will take in response to this gospel. For Christ to be made life will require more than prayers and tears of dedication. It will require you cleaving to Christ in a process that involves an inward application of the cross in your daily circumstances that will bring a glorious and true manifestation of Christ's life at the end. So threshing is the process of separating our flesh from the pure seed of Christ within. And now we're going to speak a bit about refining. We saw the purpose and need for it with the priests going through the, the fire. Refining is the process of removing dross to bring forth the gold of Christ in us. And here's just a basic description of refining silver. A refiner's fire is so hot, it causes any metal being heated upon it to be separated from the dross that is within it. The liquid metal gets heated up, the impurities rise to the surface, whereupon the refiner then removes the dross. The more the dross is separated and removed, the more pure the metal, the more precious to the refiner. Okay, dross is for removal, not identification. Once we begin our path of wanting Christ to be formed in us, and we're in the middle of our fiery trial, and we see our bad attitudes, and we see that Adamic nature rise to the surface, come out our mouth, react to our brothers, our families, we need to remember this. The dross is for removal, not identification, because it will come to the surface in this purifying process. And it's not coming to the surface to condemn you, to make you identify with it, but to be removed. Dross is called a worthless, dangerous material. It should be removed. It is brought to the surface for removal, not repair. Man, i got to work on that attitude. i got to work on that reaction. No, you've got to re reckon it dead with Christ and look to Jesus. Come, Let that gold come up. Hallelujah. The refiner just wants to skim that off the surface, and he wants to work on that gold inside. The fire and the pressure are working to bring forth the inward motives where Christ is not yet formed, the chaff that isn't really him yet, so the pure seed can be formed. Um, as these attitudes and reactions emerge in us as we're in the middle of this process when we go home later on today, we need to behold the contrast between what is Kelly and what is Christ. God knows what the difference is. He'd like me to know. It's coming to the surface for my eyes. He's well aware of the difference. This is for me. And then after I behold what the difference is between Jesus and me as my dross emerges... I identify in Christ and put my faith in the finished work of his cross. I don't lay down in depression and say I'm a worthless failure. I, I failed the gospel. I say the gospel's at work. He's dividing out what's me in Christ. I'm a priest on my way past consecration through purification to bring forth a glorious offering of the Son. Man, that's a great way. Knowing this, that your old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. We need to know that, we, that that body of sin is crucified, that dross was dealt with in this process. We need to know that, but Mallory shared that past work is finished, but now he's making it real in us. Hold on. To properly deal with dross as it is surfacing, we must fix our eyes on the cross, on Christ and him crucified. Number two, reckon that cross dead with Christ. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Reckon it so as it emerges. Identify in Christ. Reckon that dross crucified in him. Now, our dross, this is important to understand because we get confused in the process, okay? Dross was removed once and for all through Christ's death. Listen, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For God has made him to be sin for us, him who knew no sin. I'd like to say it like this. For God has made Jesus to be corruption for us 
who knew Jesus, who knew no corruption. God has made him to be dross on Calvary for us. God has made him to be chaff. For he took our flesh. He took the old Adamic nature. He took our corruption on Calvary. Jesus bore all that was rejected of God, and through his death alone, he put it away forever. Amen. Amen. It is very important to understand that Jesus alone removed the chaff and dross through his deep death. What is our place with the chaff and the dross? To see the contrast of what is Jesus and what is us, to reckon it dead and make place for the seed of God to grow, for the gold to emerge. We can never overcome our dross and our chaff because that's what we are. Only Jesus, through his death, could remove that from all humanity. Jesus was threshed on Calvary. He held us through that dark night already. He was our forerunner in the threshing he took our chaff, our stain, our flesh, our dross, and he had it removed through the treading of the cross. You want to talk about a threshing. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was threshed. You want to talk about passing through a flame. Jesus was a whole burnt offering to remove our dross on Calvary and to be a savor to the Father. He was bruised, he was beaten, and he was threshed. Why? Because he was putting away us. Hallelujah. Because Jesus already did this, we reckon these things dead by faith in his cross when they emerge. Numbers chapter 21 and verse 8 says this. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. What are we beholding? And what are we identifying with? When the poison of our old nature surfaces in us, we should look at Christ and him crucified, lifted up from the threshing floor that we're in, lifted up from that fiery trial that's exposing our dross, behold and identify with him who was threshed for us. I'm saying while you see these reactions coming out of your mouth, the poison of the old nature coming out of you, that's the time to look at Christ and him crucified who bore that for you and reckon those things dealt with through his death and yourself as one with him in his resurrection. It's important because you're going to go through this process a lot for Christ to be formed in you. And this area is where we get tripped up. The power of Calvary applied now. In Galatians, Paul said this, I am, I am crucified with Christ. The Greek verb am means a past work with continuing effects now. The power, the dunamis of Calvary flows into each moment, exacting and executing the practical effects of a work rele released but still moving from thousands of years ago. Listen, the work of the cross is not stagnant, it's not impotent. It's not stuck in a piece of time 2,000 years ago. Our faith must embrace the ever active right now. I am crucified. Let the power of Calvary come right into your present threshing situation and say, I am crucified. I reckon it so by faith. Let the power of the cross enter into that threshing process. Dross may rise and rise as the pressure and the heat of our circumstances continue. They don't, sometimes God just does not let it up. We go, Lord, I cannot take anymore. And he goes, you know, I'm, I'm trying to bring you to an end here. So I love you. I love you enough to not let you up. Why would I want to let you up when I'm bringing you into my image? Lord, I can't take anymore. I am so tempted to identify with this dross to feel like the biggest failure in Christianity, Lord, I am exhausted. My faith is wanting to falter. Listen, that's when we've got to, from the core of our heart, lift up that banner of Christ and him crucified and say, Jesus died and I am crucified with him. And this is the process he's bringing me through to bring forth his son. And I'm with you in this. And all of a sudden, we'll want to look good to the people around us. We'll want to just start looking good for a change. All these people have experienced so much of our dross. 
we'll want to start going back to method one and refining our flesh just to look good. Don't do it. Let your flesh be thoroughly purged. Let him go deep. Why? Because he's going to bring forth a deep Jesus. He's going to, the deeper he goes, the more Christ will be formed. Let, let him go deep. This is a glorious process. The end of it is so eternal. John chapter 15 and verse 4 says, Abide in me, and I will abide in you. First we abide in him. If we continue to abide in the finished work of his threshing, the dross eventually will fall away. The gold eventually will emerge. It will happen. Let's just look at a practical example of threshing in Peter. Peter is our example. And I'm going to read again from Luke chapter 22 and verses 33 through 34. This time a little different. I'm just going to speak of it in this way. First, we have Peter's vow of consecration. And Peter says to the Lord, I am ready. I'm ready to go with you into prison and into death. And Jesus answered, Peter, the cock shall not crow today, but you'll three times deny that you even know me. Like Peter, Peter was preparing himself for victory and overcoming. Pre Peter was ready to go into a glorious death as a hero of the faith. Have you ever felt that way? And Jesus said, you should be preparing yourself for the threshing because he knew in reality that Peter was about to go through a heartbreaking threshing experience that was necessary. The hour of Peter's threshing was not on the Sermon on the Mount when the words of life were just flowing in ways that were just making people's hearts burn within them. The hour of threshing was not on the Mount of Transfiguration when the glory of God was just shining out of Jesus. The hour of threshing was not at the miracle service where all the people were being fed miraculously, loaves and fishes, or, or when Peter was walking on the water. The hour of threshing came when the disciples were scattered, when the enemy was overcoming God's people, when Jesus was dying on the cross as a criminal. Does this look like an out-of-control hour? Think in your own life. Does it just look out of control? It does look out of control. Is it out of control? No, it's the time of threshing. It's the hour of threshing. For the teachings from the Sermon on the Mount to become life in Peter, for the glory that was revealed on the Mount of Transfiguration to become glory in Peter, the hour of threshing had to come. Thank you, God, for the hour of threshing. God was answering Peter's prayer of consecration. Now, Peter denied the Lord three times. I call this the three strikes and you're out. God threshes us until we are convinced there's no good thing in us. As long as we have confidence in our flesh, the threshing's going to keep going to separate us from the seed. Once again, this isn't for God. God's not trying to just make you feel really bad until you really feel bad. He's trying to work it in us that we know the difference forevermore between what is me and what is Christ, not I. The big old not I will be engraved in our being, and nothing will ever change that after the threshing. The contrast is meant to kill you, mortally wound you, devastate you, so there's nothing left living in your earth but Christ. Now, the cross did that, but we're talking about the dunamis of Calvary working in us so Christ can be formed. We have to go through the threshing for that to happen. Now, here's Peter's threshing contrast. Here's a good one. Think about this, the very Son of God dying in front of you, not opening his mouth, looking you in the eye as he's being beaten by the Romans and carrying a tree on his back along with the sins of the world, and you're standing by a fire opening your mouth and cursing. Look at the contrast in Peter's hour of threshing. The Lamb of God is dying on a cross, and Peter is running away from the cross. The Lamb of God is being roasted in the flames of Calvary, and Peter is warming his flesh with it. You, you can recount that all day. If I could do it again, I would say something different. I, would, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't curse. I wouldn't deny you. No, you would, you would, you would, you would, you would, you would, you would until Christ be formed and you will fail. You must fail. You have to fail. Failure is part of this process. Let it work to divide out you from Christ, the seed from the chaff, the dross from the gold, so that the Lord can form his son in you. Don't resist it. 
by self-justification or excuses or try to make it look better. Let the Lord have his way. Understand what he's doing so you can be with him in it. Jesus knew how Satan would attack Peter. Oh, this is so for us. Please hear this. In the hour of his threshing, in the very same scriptures in Luke chapter 22, before Peter even said his vow of consecration, Jesus in his foreknowledge said this to Peter. Peter, Satan has desired to have you, listen to this, that he may sift you as wheat. Threshing words. But Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith would fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brothers who will have to go through the same process. Listen, Satan wants to sift you unto himself. I will give you proof for that. Satan has desired to have you. Not to make you feel bad. To have you that he might sift you as wheat. Satan wants to use the threshing process to separate you to himself. Jesus wants to use the threshing process to separate you to Christ in you. Satan distorts the true purpose of threshing to make it feel tormenting, to make the cross seem like it's a, a tormenting cross, a punishing cross. He wants you to feel condemned, discouraged, depressed, suicidal, quit. The gospel doesn't work. I failed God too much. I'm too far gone. Uh, that is Satan sifting you unto himself while God's trying to bring forth his son in you. Don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. Find the purpose of God in your life and let it work to the glorious end of Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus threshes us unto himself. Listen, unto eternal union with his life and fruitful, fruitfulness formed in us. God desires you to understand his heart in this process so much that when your brothers go through threshing, you can sit down and strengthen their faith. When you're converted, when you've passed through this flame and this threshing, you go to those younger ones who need Christ formed to them, and you hold them in your arms, and you say, listen, this is part of, you're one with him. He brings forth his life out of this. Be converted, be strengthened, lift high the banner of Christ. You'll speak out from that place of knowing the Lord. And you'll have mercy, won't you? Compassion, because this process really does, really does break us down. All those prideful, harsh things, they go away, and they need to go away. They're chaff, man. The enemy wants you to feel like your core is defiled. I, I'm just totally, God's allowing all this dross to come to the surface, all this chaff to be exposed. And after a while, you are so immersed in your ugliness, in your attitudes, that you, you feel like that's who you are. And guess who comes along? Satan. Yep, that's who you are. I mean, you're a hypocrite not to, not to totally believe that you are that bad attitude, that you are that. That's you. It's coming up from your innermost being. All the dross, like vomit. That's who you really are deep down there. Your core is defiled. No, your core is the incorruptible seed, which seed is Christ, and he cannot be defiled. He's your identity. He is your life. There may be some dross way deep down there that he brings to the surface and flesh that needs to be exposed, but that's not your core. That's not your eternal identity. That's not who you are for worlds without end. You are one with Jesus, and that incorruptible seed is your core. Satan can't defile it. He wants to make you feel like he can. He wants to sift you unto himself. He wants to destroy Christ being formed in you by, by deceiving you with his methods of sense realm distortions. Go by what you feel, by what you see, by what you used to be. Deny the cross. Deny the death. Deny the threshing. No, sir. Be converted and understand this process and be with him in it. Hallelujah. Satan wants to stop the maturing process because he does not want that seed to grow in you. And his best, best tactic is to make you feel so depressed and defiled by your own corruption that you just quit because you don't want to be a hypocrite. It's a bunch of lies. Jesus was made our corruption and he put it away. He was bringing the dross to the surface to skim it off because it's already dead and we must reckon it so. He's allowing it to work a contrast in us so the practical work of the cross will be made real in our lives. It's a good work. Peter said, being born again of incorruptible seed. Here's Peter again. Why do you think we keep going to Peter? Because the guy understands what, what's happening. He's been through this thing. Um, our core identity 
is oneness with Christ, even though our flesh and soul will feel the dross. When we understand what God is doing, when we understand that Jesus in us is not hurt or defiled by this process, but he's going to flourish and grow and form through it, we get excited. Instead of being depressed, we're, man, Jesus is going to come forth. That incorruptible seed is going to start being separated from all my flesh. God's going to form in me. We can become like David. We can know what David knew. And when he said it in Psalm 51, 6, it's ever so clear. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part, thou shalt make. Now, P David knew that word of God's going to have to go deep, dividing joint from marrow, motive from intent. That's not fun. Oh, but he wasn't afraid of it. Why? He knew he was one with Jesus, and he wanted Jesus to be formed in the very depths of his motives. He wanted Christ to have so much ground that he was willing to go through the deepest threshing, the deepest refining process. When we know the heart of God, we will not, number one, remove ourselves from the process, because you know you can. Number two, stop listening to the preaching of the cross. Stop listening to the message of the cross because it's tormenting you, because Satan keeps telling you it's tormenting trying to sift you unto himself. We will not justify our reactions when the dross comes to the surface and blame everybody else. Hey, man, it's my dross. I claim it. They may be wrong. They may be wrong. But I got dross coming up, and it's about this that God is looking at. It ain't that situation. It may be completely, purely, 100% wrong. God does not care. He, he's wanting to get your dross up so you can know that you need Jesus and that you have let that seed start forming. And then we know, like Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, we know that all things, the evil, the unjust, the enemy, all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose, cleave to him with purpose of heart. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to share something personal here. Um, about a month ago when I was in Ireland, I spent some time with the Lord one morning, and the Holy Spirit did a, a dealing in my heart. He shared something with me. And I really believe this might help some of us here. Um, he showed me over the past 10 years areas where I had really, 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 really wanted to bring forth Christ and just go the way of the lamb and bless my enemies and lay my life down and go the extra mile. You know, we all feel that way. And I'd get up from my knees and I'd immediately fail. And I'd fall down and pray again and I'd get up and I'd fail. And I'd and fail and fail until finally just my, my heart started to just break. I was just like, Lord, I am just... I am just a failure. I don't even want to look in your eyes anymore. My head's just bowed down. I, I'm a hypocrite to even say I want Jesus to live in me because when I walk out of this room, I'm going to live in me. And I and I just, the depression had gotten so great at times that, I mean, I just, you know, I just, I was just depressed. And it was hard, you know, because I love Jesus so much and you love Jesus so much. And when you keep failing him like that and you don't understand the threshing process and you think it's when you're supposed to be having this glorious release of life and all you're releasing is dross, man, your heart starts to break. And certain things in your conscience can start to grow hard against God. And you can go, you know, it works for this person. It works for that person. I love him. I pray. But all I do is fail. And uh, it just affects your relationship with the Lord. You've got shame and failure so much that you just... It can become a permanent condition, like that woman who was bowed down for those 18 years or what. You know, you can just start just looking at your flesh and, and just being condemned the rest of your life. And um, the Lord told me, he said, you know, Kelly, you thought you were, you were being sown like the Lamb of God into a glorious death. And he said, Kelly, it wasn't your hour of sowing. It was your hour of threshing. You were not meant to have a glorious release of Christ during those times. You were meant to fail so deep that you would never again put confidence in your flesh, that you would never again have a proud, arrogant attitude about Jesus. You would be broken, that you would be compassionate to your brothers, that you would know the difference of these things. And, um, and then, at, uh, you know, which he did work that in me during that, you know, he has more to go, but he worked a measure of those things during that time. And then he showed me this picture of a... a and I didn't know what it was at the time, but it was just this picture of all this clutter of memories and this clutter of failures. And every time I'd want to go to the Lord, all these memories and all these failures and all these things would just clutter my mind. So I, I, I wouldn't just be able to just be with the Lord or release the Lord. And he said, Kelly, it's time to let the Holy Spirit winnow away 
the chaff that I used at one point, but now the seed is there. Let the chaff get out of your heart. It is cluttering your mind. These memories, these failures, are they're, const- they're constricting the seed. They're covering over the gold. And the Holy Spirit needs to blow in there and just blow them away back to the earth, out of your heart, out of your remembrance, out of your mind. They brought forth Christ. They brought forth a new heart in me, a new separation unto Jesus. They're done. And at, I'm going to pass around some pictures, but it, this is a combine harvester, and it just shows the seeds going into the bin, but all that dust behind it, it's just the chaff blowing out into the wind. And the Holy Spirit wants to blow through our temple. He just wants to blow out all that chaff, winnow out all that draws, winnow out all those memories, those failures, those things that clutter our hearts so we just can't move forward with the seed. Here's just a technical thing concerning winnowing. During the growth of a wheat plant, the, well, l- let me just say, let me say this last because we're getting a little short on time. Once the true seed has matured from our trials and tribulations, the chaff is no longer necessary. From some of our past experiences, we can point where God was forming his son in us. When the trial has done its job, it becomes chaff. However, it is human tendency to brood over our past trial which causes this chaff to clutter our hearts. It's time for the chaff to be blown away by the tender winds of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we, w- we must remember that the harvest is a process. Each part of the ha- harvest is completely necessary. You know, the calendar of Israel is around the feasts of the harvest, the maturing of the seed in us. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, To everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up, a time to be threshed, a time to be sown. There's a time for threshing. There's a time to be with the Lord in that part of the harvest. We can flow with God in his season for flesh threshing when we understand this. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4 and 16 and think about it as you're with the Lord in, in your season of, of threshing. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish... Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more and exceedingly great eternal weight of glory. There is no thought of failure or fatigue or surrender here. The outward man begins to give place before the advent of that inner man who is forever renewed. Even while the outer man shows the evidence of death, a far more exceeding weight of glory and hope is coming into light and completely counterbalancing and outweighing these temporary trials. We can shed that mortal coil. We can let our outward perish. Like a tree in the autumn time, we can let our leaves fall away and die off. We can let the old be stripped away like dead skin, knowing that the sap of Christ's life within us will come forth in the time of life. Don't justify, don't identify with, don't hold on to what God has crucified, rejected, and threshed away in his son. Release it, let it go. Psalm 126, verse 5 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth beareth precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Harvesting takes a long time, many tears, much refining, much threshing, much loving one another when all you see is chaff. But let's shed our tears to water the seed and not mourn our corruption. Hallelujah. Threshing is not just individual. It's corporate. We must learn to be with the Lord and be with each other in this process. And I'm going to read something concerning dross and chaff in relationships, and I believe it's very important for us. In your marriage, your family, and your relationships, where both people are gathered together as unto the Lord, but not built yet, but they are gathered together unto Jesus. The closer they draw together, the more dross seems to come to the surface. And the more there's a separating of what is the chaff 
as it is threshed out in our trials and tribulations, and what is the sun? But listen, that is not the core of your relationship. There is gold in there. There's gold in there. The seed, there is a preciousness not yet revealed or formed yet that defines who you really are and who you eternally will be. There is a tempering together that will happen once Jesus comes out from the threshing. Once he emerges from the fire, he will draw you and knit you and forge you together in a oneness that is him, and no gates of hell will destroy it. There is no trial, no tribulation that will undo what the Lord has brought forth in oneness through this process. Don't be discouraged in the threshing. Don't be discouraged in the refining. Don't think it's strange when you can't get along with those you were meant to get along with. Let the dross come forth. Let the chaff be removed. Let all the elements of our flesh and nature be removed. In, in time, the winds of the Spirit will blow all that chaff away like dust carried from your remembrance and your relationship. And what will remain is something that is eternal, something that will be built, something that will be solid, something that will be glorious, something that will be Christ, not just in this life, but forevermore. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm running short on time, and there's some very important points here, so I'm going to go quickly. Listen to the end of threshing. The end of threshing came at a time of deep crisis and tribulation for David. In First Chronicles chapter 21, verses 22 and 28, David said to Ornan, Grant me the piece of this threshing floor that I may build an altar thereupon. The altar was where the temple was built. David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. Listen, where Solomon's temple was built was on a threshing floor. Do you think that was just a coincidence? Oh, no, because you know what was supposed to fill the temple in, in the re fulfillment now? The seed alone. The sun alone. So there had to be some threshing out the flesh before you're going to build a house for the sun to live in. But, man, if you let that threshing floor happen in your life, you become a temple of the living God where Christ himself is the, the glory in that temple. Okay, the end of refining is going to be uh, Revelation chapter 21, and I'm just going to quickly read a bit of it for time's sake. We've got stones, precious stones, uh, sardis, I can't say, a barrel, topaz, um, amethyst. The 12 gates are pearls. Um, these pearls are, are all one. The streets of the city are pure gold. We see all these re refined jewels, all these things that have passed through this great process of pressure and refining, building together the new Jerusalem. It's a picture of the bride of Christ. What's the end of going through the refining fires to let Christ be formed in you? Your a habitation for the Lamb? A new Jerusalem that's tempered together as one that bears only his glory, contains only his life and light? That's the end of the refining process, the new Jerusalem. Refined stones knit together as one, containing the Lamb alone as the glory. And the consecrated priest, once he's passed through his refining and, and purification process, now he's offering up the Son, the sweet savor of Christ. Now he's offering up the Lamb to God. Hallelujah. Is it worth it to go through the threshing? Look what God gets. He gets a temple. He gets a home. He gets a bride in his image that's filled with the glory of the Lamb. He gets a kingdom of priests offering up Christ instead of their own works. Is it worth it? This is my final section. It's called the hallelujahs of those who passed through threshing. There are hallelujahs that are not from worship services where miracles and revivals are going on, blessing our flesh and making us feel good in his presence. There are hallelujahs going up from prison cells, from dark, cold places, from threshing floors, from lonely, lonely places going up like the sweet breaking through of the seed from the dark husk and dirt of this earth. That hallelujah is a sweet savor of Christ to the Father. It's not just praise. It is the praise that has come out of the threshing, out of the refining, out from the sun that is finally breaking free from our core, out from the soil, out from the body, manifesting the glorious Christ in this dark earth. It is the gold finally emerging from the great pressures and heat. 
No longer are bad attitudes emerging, but Christ himself is shining forth. These are the hallelujahs that reach the throne of God. This is the hallelujah that's carried on the wings of the spirit of the lamb. It's the hallelujah that comes from the heart of the son. This is the Abba. This is the pure. This is the gold. This is the seed. Amen. And um, I just had a, in closing, I did have a song to go with that. Um, I think my time is finished for the sharing, so I'm just going to sing this. And um, just let the Holy Spirit minister to you. <laughs>